So as Gareth mentioned, we, we are part of, of this uh, preview project, which I'll show you some information on a bit later on, uh, which is just about to start. And I think it's, it's fair to say that the people who set it up didn't really envisage what it is they've created until we had a meeting in Copenhagen about a month ago now, which um, uh, and we realized about three months ago just what this entailed, but I'll tell you about it later. And, and so just be warned, if you are in research, don't ever just agree to do something. You've got to read the small print first because it's uh, uh, otherwise a problem. So uh, that project is about um, taking people who are predominantly overweight and already have impaired carbohydrate metabolism on a track to becoming diabetic and seeing if with a combination of diet and exercise you can do something about it. So Gareth um, asked me to to come and talk uh, about obesity and, and some of the dietary aspects. This, this is actually going to be predominantly diet rather than physical activity oriented, although there's a, there is a physical activity slide at the very end which you might like, um, it, just because it shows you the problem you've got um, in store in the future. So uh, what I want to do is, is, is just briefly cover energy balance for you and then tell you what the issues are in terms of obesity and the dietary aspects and then some of the more recent things that we've been looking at in relation to potential um, either detrimental aspects of meal patterns and diet composition or potential beneficial aspects of some, some components of the diet. Um, and then I'll say something about dairy products at the end because there's quite a lot of hype at the moment about how they might either be harmful or beneficial um, depending upon uh, which studies you look at. And it just illustrates for you some of the problems in in, in nutritional research where, where studies are done differently and then people try and do what's called a meta-analysis and systematic review to bring them all together. And it's like bringing together sort of bananas and pears and, and, and saying that fruit does this uh, to you in a certain context and actually it may not because they could be very different from each other. So if we think about the very simple basic physiology to start with, um, where the, the pivot point is in the middle here, if your energy intake is, is uh, in balance with your energy expenditure, then you're in what we call energy balance or zero energy balance. If intake exceeds expenditure, this side goes down, the arrow goes up, and you're in positive balance, and that's what happens during the development of obesity. And conversely, if you can get people to burn off more energy than they're taking in, then they'll move into negative balance, which is what we're going to try and do um, in, over the next three and a half years in this project. What you have to remember is that positive energy balance is not always bad. Um, pregnancy, and certainly in most cases, certainly in the Western world now, uh, in terms of pregnancy, then uh, that is a situation of, of modest positive energy balance. Growth in children can only happen if you have positive energy balance. So, so it isn't always a problem. It's only when the positive balance is leading to the development of obesity. And conversely, negative balance can be voluntary when you're trying to lose weight can be a consequence of disease, wasting type diseases, or it can be imposed on you if, if you have a, a sort of social economic crisis and, and there's a, a failure of food supply so you get starvation. Um, the other point about this is, is, and this is something, I'm sorry if that screen, if the computer's in the way at the bottom here, but the other point to make here is, is people do not become obese overnight. It actually takes several years of cumulative positive energy balance before you turn from a BMI 25 into a BMI 30 plus. Um, and most, most cases of positive imbalance only have about 100 to 150 calories a day surplus. And if you do the calculations, then, then actually that will take two and a half to three years to turn from BMI 25, which is healthy, to BMI 30. So when somebody says, oh, you know, I've been overeating over Christmas and I've become obese, I'm afraid that's not true. You were becoming obese well before that, and it's just the, the Christmas splurge which has finally put you uh, into the body mass index 30 category. So it's a slow development process. The, the corollary to that is, of course, it takes a long time to get rid of it, especially if you're excessively obese. So, so as people who want a quick fix, um, who want to um, you know, go on the latest diet or exercise fad and in four weeks' time be, be, have lost 10 stone. That's not going to happen. But people think it can happen, and, and that's one of the problems. So what is obesity? In, in very simple terms, it's too much body fat, 
Um, the only problem we have is, from a physiological perspective, we have no idea how much is too much. Um, or too much fat in the wrong place. We've got a better idea about that. And by the wrong place, of course, we mean here. We mean within, within the abdomen, in the liver, in some of the other vital organs as well. Um, we assess it predominantly from body mass index, but this can be very misleading. Um, we can also assess fat content, of course, by measuring it. And, and uh, basically, if you've got a body mass index of 30, which is the beginning of the clinical definition of obesity, uh, then in men, that equates to approximately 30% of body weight as pure fat, and in women, approximately 35% because of the effect of, of ovarian steroids on, on fat content and fat distribution. Um, but of course, clinically, we never measure fat content um, in, in large numbers of people. Um, and, and if you do, then most people would use bioimpedance to do that, and that's absolutely useless at the individual level for giving you an accurate measure of, of body fat content. So we, we rely really on body mass index, and it can be misleading. Some of your athletic rugby players will have a BMI way over 30, but they'll have a waist of 34 inches or less, and their thighs are probably as big as their waists are. And they are not obese, but they're heavy, because they're very muscular. Their problem is when they stop playing rugby and carry on drinking and uh, uh, see what they're like in 10 years' time. But that's a different um, discussion. <coughs> this is the thing that is more and more useful in terms of identifying the too much fat in the wrong place element. Waist circumference, uh, above 102 centimeters, which is about 40 inches, is, is, is really the threshold for highest risk of complications, metabolic complications of obesity in men. And greater than 88 centimeters uh, in women is also the threshold for the, 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 the highest level of risk of having too much abdominal fat. And so from a clinical perspective, a measurement of waste is, is as long as people do it properly, a measurement of waste is, is probably more useful than a measurement of body mass index. Why are we worried about it? Well, it's not a cosmetic it shouldn't be a cosmetic concern, although people, uh, many people are motivated because of the cosmetic aspects of, of body shape and size aspects of obesity. But this is why, from a health perspective and as a sort of public health cost perspective, we are concerned about obesity. It is the second, in, in general terms, it's the second biggest cause of cardiovascular disease after cigarette smoking. And in some populations, it's, it's where there's low levels of smoking, it's the, it's the biggest cause. So cardiovascular disease risk is increased in the obese. Type 2 diabetes is very much increased, which is why Gareth and I are involved in this new project. Uh, certain cancers, breast cancer, uh, colonic cancer, and some other cancers are, are increased um, uh, incidence in, in obesity, especially severe obesity. Uh, gallstones are more common. Arthritis, certainly in the, in the knee and the ankle, in the lower limbs, uh, because of the increased uh, mass that's being carried about. There's more uh, social aspects in terms of more sick leave and lots of psychosocial problems. And the intra-abdominal fat, the, the large waist, particularly increases the risk of these two. So the cardiovascular disease and, uh, and the type 2 diabetes are increased, even if your BMI is less than 30. So if you've got a large waist um, but, a, but a, a BMI of 28, you're still at high risk of, of those first two. And this is particularly relevant in terms of some of our ethnic minority populations. So if you look at some of the Asians, in, in certainly in the Midlands, where I come from, uh, then our Indian and Pakistani populations probably only have a BMI of 28, but a large waist, and they have a much increased risk of, of these two complications. So the prevalence of obesity uh, is increasing around the world. It's increasing in the developed world. It's increasing incredibly rapidly in Eastern Europe since the the fall of communism and the disappearance of state-funded jobs. Um, and so lots of, of uh, much less activity, lots of sedentariness, but lots of stodgy, energy-dense foods. Um, so Eastern Europe is, is, is almost as bad as the United Kingdom as far as obesity is concerned. The transition economies are definitely showing increased prevalences of obesity, both China and India, and even the developing world. There's nearly as much obesity as there is under nutrition in the developing world. Um, now, so, so it isn't just a, 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 um, a developed world problem. Some of you may have seen this, there's a series of slides now, but some of you may have seen these slides from the United States from 1985 through to now, where the, the intensity of blueness and eventually of redness is an indication of the, the, um, 
proportion of the population that, that has a body mass index over 30. Um, although this was done retrospectively, because of course being American, they used to uh, note down their weight in pounds and their height in feet and inches, and it's been, it's been sort of back calculated eventually. So the white ones here show that in the mid-80s there was a lot of, uh, of, of the United States where there was no information. Uh, but where there was information, particularly in the, uh, the eastern um, the, uh, states here, uh, 10 to 14 percent was the worst prevalence of obesity. And then as time proceeds, it gets darker and then starts to become orange and red. And so the orange and red are 25 to 29 percent of the population is obese, or more than 30 percent down here in Louisiana and, and the, these southern states. That one has always uh, stuck out as being different. Uh, and, and even when everything else just about, apart from, uh, I think that's New York State, uh, or might, it might be Boston, anyway, somewhere in New England up here, um, this one has, is rather interesting. And this, of course, is Colorado, where there is um, something like 300 days a year of sunshine, they tell you. I think it's the tourist board that tells you that. But more importantly, they've had a statewide initiative in physical activity and diet for about the last 20 years. And a guy called Jim Hill, who is actually not very sylph-like himself. He's a good friend of mine. He's, he certainly looks like a, a, an ex-Welsh prop forward, if you ask me. But, but, but he has pushed the state legislature and the state authorities to, to drive physical activity, use of pedometers, and um, now accelerometers, and diet. And so it was really uh, the place where there was much less obesity than anywhere else in the United States. But unfortunately, in 2012, uh, Colorado now should be this, this beige color, because now even Colorado has a, a prevalence of obesity above 20%. So, so even with all these public health interventions, you still don't seem to be able to stop it. And you can now see it is the only state in the United States that, it, that is, um, uh, well, sorry, that was in 2007. It was the only state that was in that state. But now, even it has caught up. So, so the United States is in a terrible position. For those of you who have been to the United States, you look at that picture and you think, that's got to be wrong. Because if you look at that, there's only these three states where more than a third of the population is obese. You get off a plane in Chicago, in New York, or Los Angeles, and what do you see in front of you? Enormous fat people and large numbers of them. Anybody know what is, why it is that, that, that actually this is, is, is uh, an underrepresentation? How do you think they gathered the data? There are large numbers of people involved here, but how do you think they gathered the data? Self-report, Self -report, yes, telephone interview. They ring up 10,000 people a year, and they ask them how tall they are, and they ask them how heavy they are. And, and, and it's now well established that if you do that, somebody adds you know, about five centimeters on and loses about five kilos in weight. And, and so this is self-report, but it was always self-report. So, so the, the, the time-related trend is reliable, but the absolute value is completely wrong. And we know that because in NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, like in our National Diet and Nutrition Survey, they measure people. And if you look at NHANES, then actually the average for the United States is about 32% obese, okay? whereas the average of that would not be 32%. So, so, but the trend is, 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 a, is frightening. So in the UK, um, uh, the, the obesity prevalence has been rising steadily over the past 20 years. It does seem to be flattening off a little bit, so, so there may be a uh, cause for hope. It's about 25% in adults now, um, and so that is a problem. There are some um, uh, uh, regional differences and, and some socioeconomic status differences, which, as you might remember, has got, caused at least one health minister to get herself into serious trouble. She happens to be my MP as well, so, uh, and I sit on two Department of Health committees, which, which she chairs. So. <laughs> We gave her a seriously hard time of, um, of, of spe you know, not speaking in public when you actually don't know exactly what it is you're talking about. The sad thing is she's right. If, if you actually look at the latest, you, and I could show you later, it's on my laptop, the latest National Obesity Observatory uh, information does show a, a socioeconomic status progression of obesity in, in the British population. Um, but but uh, it doesn't mean that everybody who's waddling down the street comes from a low SES background, which is what she was reported as having. <coughs> so one in four of UK adults is obese. Childhood overweight and obesity is also increasing, which is a real worry. 
um, and, and that is, is, is a serious concern. And there are socioeconomic uh, status inequalities in the um, prevalence of obesity. So what are the risk factors for the development of obesity? Um, there are rare genetic disorders that give rise to obesity, but that doesn't explain one in four of the population. There is a genetic predisposition, which means that in certain conditions, if you expose people with those genes to the wrong environment, they'll become obese. Um, but again, that might explain some of it, but, but uh, it, it, the problem is that the science hasn't really established fully yet what these susceptibility genes might be. And, and so it, it only explains, from what we know at the moment, these susceptibility genes only explain a small percentage of the total uh, prevalence of obesity, but a lot of work is going on. Clearly diets involved um, and physical activity or physical inactivity and then there are other aspects as well, but, but the diet is the one that I want to focus on. I bought this, hope this was a postcard I bought in Florida about eight years ago and these ladies clearly illustrate uh, that they're following their own advice in terms of what causes obesity. Um, they know that it's something to do with diet and something to do with high fat energy dense foods, uh, particularly, and this is a concern at the moment, uh, drinks containing energy. And I had to remind the Department of Health that alcoholic drinks have got calories in them. Um, you know this, this uh, food res this responsibility deal that, that the previous Secretary of State launched, it is still continuing and there is a food network and there is an alcohol network. And, and I sit on the food network. Um, advisory group and, and we were told we weren't allowed to talk about calories in alcoholic drinks because that was the responsibility of the alcohol network and we said well that's completely stupid especially if you look at the National Diet and Nutrition Survey of British um, consumption of food the single biggest category of, of things we consume that contribute to the adult British diet is alcoholic drinks it's not the alcohol necessarily, because a lot of them have got carbohydrate in. But alcoholic drinks is the single biggest category of contributor to our calorie intake. It's about the fourth biggest in 16 to 18 year old children. Um, which is something, seeing as they're not supposed to be consuming the stuff, but anyway. Um, so, so drinks containing energy, sugary drinks, fruit juices, uh, milk as well of course, as well as alcoholic drinks are, are potential contributors. Portion size has increased a lot over the years. Um, sedentary behavior, tending to increase snacking, uh, is also a concern. And uh, erratic eating patterns is something we've, we've been interested in and done some, some, some work on. Just to show you, uh, this is quite old now, this is about nearly 20 years old, these observations, made in Cambridge um, by Susan Jebb and, and Andrew Prentice and uh, James Stubbs. Um, showing that energy density is really very important. So by energy density of meals, I mean you know, the amount of calories per 100 grams of food. And, and generally speaking, the higher the fat content, the greater the energy density will be. But the food industry is very good at taking water out of food um, in some circumstances. So actually, some of the high carbohydrate foods are qu quite high in energy density, although they could never get above four calories per gram. And what we have here is a group of, in fact, Cambridge PhD students who, who loved this experiment because they got locked inside a whole body calorimeter for three separate periods of seven days at a time. And they were paid to do this, they were given all their food, and they could just sit there and write their theses. So they really loved this, this experiment. But what they didn't, well, they knew what the idea was, but they had no idea what they were eating when. On the three separate occasions, they had a diet for the week that was low in fat, had a medium fat content or a high fat content. And this is the weight of food consumed over seven days, and you can see that they just ate the same weight of food each time. Okay? This is calories consumed or megajoules consumed, and of course, the same weight of food with a high fat content means that you eat a lot more energy than if it's the low fat content. And that lot more is nearly 50% more energy. They were in the whole body calorimeter, so you could measure their energy expenditure, so you actually get energy balance over seven days. Energy balance, zero balance is there. So the low fat, this was 20% calories as fat, was associated with a slight negative energy balance, not significant statistically. 40% calories as fat, which is just above the average British diet, um, produced four megajoules of positive energy balance in seven days. Okay, that's a lot. 60% calories as fat, which is a bit excessive unless you live in Scotland or 
northern England, um, then uh, produced actually 18 megajoules. That's a hell of a lot of, of excess um, energy being stored in the body. So their, their, their belts would have been tight after a week of doing that. There's no doubt about it. But this was covert overeating because they had no idea. It also shows you that, that certainly we don't regulate our energy intake at all well over that seven-day period. There's no indication that this is, this is flattening off. This has been done, this has been repeated in community-based studies, so it's not just a, a, a freak of the calorimeter. And, and it's been repeated by just manipulating the carbohydrate content, so the difference in energy density is a lot smaller. And you get the same results. Adults are not good at detecting what they're eating and, and eating to satisfy an energy requirement. We tend to get programmed into eating a certain bulk of food, and that's what we eat. Okay, and so if you want to change people's behavior, you've got to change that mindset. So um, my, my colleague Moira Taylor, who, who uh, Gareth and Mel and Kelly have met, uh, is, is an academic dietitian. She actually did her PhD with a guy called John Garrow, who really reawakened UK interest in obesity in the, in the early to mid 70s. And, and one of the things that she observed when doing her PhD studies on, on obese patients was, was when you try and take a diet history from them, first of all, you've got to try and get them to be honest uh, and, and uh, about what they're eating and recognize that, that she just didn't want to know what they ate at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but she wanted to know what they ate throughout the day. But, but what she noticed was that they had very irregular eating patterns. So some days they would they just graze the whole day. Other days they would eat once or twice, but eat enormous amounts once they were um, fully accurate in, in, in recording it. So, so we were, we've become interested in, in this clinical observation of erratic eating and whether that might contribute to overeating and to difficulties in weight management. And, and that is reinforced by the fact that most dietary interventions to try and reduce weight have very rigid um, uh, eating patterns uh, and meal times and, and so on. Um, and so we've been looking at the effects of erratic eating on metabolism and reported energy intake. Reported energy intake, so, so that's always a, a, a weakness. And we developed this paradigm which is, is quite interesting where we, we actually get people to eat regularly Three meals and three snacks. So for most people, that's more than they would normally, more, more eating occasions they'd normally have uh, in, a, in, a, in a day. Um, or chaotically, where, where they ate between three and nine times a day. But we told them how many times to eat on each day. So over a two-week period, they had exactly the same number of meals. Okay, But it was either six times a day or somewhere between three and nine times a day. And we also, so that it was a little bit easier to interpret at the end, the final two days of the erratic period, there were five meals on the penultimate day and six on the last day, whereas in the, in the regular period, there were always six. So, so the, the end two days were pretty similar. And we measured blood lipids and insulin sensitivity and st food stimulation of energy expenditure, um, and we asked them to record their food intake. So what we have here, these are the non-obese women that we've studied, and what we have here are the postprandial, so this is a test meal that you measure the energy expenditure response to in a resting person, and the insulin responses to the test meal, um, and the test meal's got a high carbohydrate content. So this is in the morning after the 14 days. Before the regular eating pattern, this is the mag magnitude of the thermogenic response. After the regular 14 days eating, regular eating, it's a bit higher. Before the irregular, it happens to be a bit higher, but after the, after the irregular, it's gone down substantially. So it tends to go up with regular eating in non-obese women, and it comes down. So blunting of, of thermogenesis will tend to increase the possibility of um, uh, putting weight on because you've decreased energy expenditure. This is even more interesting. Regular eating reduces the insulin response to cope with the carbohydrate load. So that's an improvement in insulin sensitivity. Irregular eating increases the insulin response. So they become insulin resistant with two weeks of irregular eating. Um, so, so that is particularly interesting. And um, the, the reported dietary intakes in the regular pattern were about 8 megajoules, 2,000 calories a day. In the, the um, three of the, the sort of extremes, so the nine and the three meals per day and the six in the middle, there's about a... Um, 
5% or so increase in reported energy intake. They found it very difficult not to overeat with these, these high frequencies. Um, and so there was certainly a, a, an interesting um, problem in that if, if you have this erratic eating, it makes you insulin resistant, it reduces your thermogenesis, but it also makes it very difficult to, to eat um, uh, the same calorie intake as you would with normal eating. We've also studied overweight subjects, and this time included men, but this time um, what we did was we gave them all the food and we fixed the energy intake so that we actually wouldn't, wouldn't allow energy intake to be a confounder in the responses. Um, the study design, is, 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 it was exactly the same in terms of the number of meals per day. We fixed the composition of the food as well, so, so that we tried to control things as much as possible. Um, what we did get them to do was to do some simple visual analog scale ratings of hunger and fullness. And the blue ones are the regular meal pattern, and the purple ones are the irregular. And you can see here, generally speaking, that they are more hungry throughout the day, and this, these were days where they had exactly the same number of meals. They were more hungry at the end of the two-week period when they were on the irregular meal pattern than on the regular one, and they were less full. So this certainly, and, the, and these are, are you know, filled in around the same meals provided by us. So, so if you've got erratic eating, it has all sorts of behavioral effects. Um, we also made similar observations as far as the thermogenic responses are concerned. Regular eating, no difference. This includes men and women this time, but there was no difference between the men and women. Irregular eating decreases it. The students in the audience will notice that we've been very um, smart here and chopped off most of the y-axis. Okay, So it's not quite as big an effect as it looks. But it's still a, a, um, a, 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 a meaningful reduction. 0.25 down to 0.23, so almost a 10% reduction in the thermogenic response. If that was sustained, then that would clearly lead to more positive energy balance. So the other thing that's of interest is diet composition, um, and, and whether or not diet composition is, is important uh, as far as weight loss is concerned uh, during diet, um, uh, when you're attempting a, a weight reduction diet. It might affect the initial weight loss, but, but actually it doesn't really matter after a few weeks what diet you are on, um, if provided you can achieve a low energy intake. And the thing is that some diets, some weight reduction diets, make it easier to stick to them and to keep to a low energy intake. The thing that is of interest is actually that diet composition might help you keep the weight off afterwards. And this is the basis of the study that Gareth and I and, and, and the others here are involved in. And the thing that's particularly of interest is that this maintenance diet, if it's higher in protein and has a lower glycemic index, that is, it, 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 the carbohydrate is, is a more complex type of carbohydrate that is not absorbed quickly, and so the blood glucose response to your meal carbohydrate is smaller uh, than it otherwise would be. That's what we mean by a low glycemic index. There's some evidence that that may be of benefit in helping maintain weight loss. This illustrates the, the weight loss you get with different diets. This was a six-month study we did uh, in combination with four other centers in the United Kingdom. Um, yeah, the one in, in Northern Ireland and the rest were in England, I think. But, but th there were five centers involved in this in total. There's about 60 people in each of these diet groups. And this is the Atkins diet. So this is a high-protein, low-carbohydrate, high-fat diet. Uh, that's Rosemary Connolly diet and exercise plan, Weight Watchers, and slim fast. And in the first month, Atkins was better, but by six months, actually, they were all the same. The slim fast was slightly less good, but they'd all lost nine to 10 kilos, or nine to 10% of body weight. There was a control group here who were promised they could have whatever they wanted after six months, as long as they carried on eating normally for the six months. And so actually, it doesn't matter um, that, that what you eat, as long as, as long as you eat a reduced energy intake. And, and for some people, it was easier to stick to one type of diet compared to another. The depressing thing for the exercise people is that ro the Rosemary Connolly plan, which has got a lot of exercise in it, didn't give you any more weight loss than, than the others over that time period. Um, this is where we um, have been triggered to, to begin to think that the, the diet composition may be of value in maintaining weight loss. This was a, a previous EU study, I think it was a Framework 6 study, which was called Diogenes, so it's diabetes, obesity, and genes. And people were on a low-calorie diet for about two months to lose 8% of weight. 
And then they were randomized to one of five treatments um, with different protein and glycemic index contents of the diets. And the important thing is, is this one down here. This is the high protein, low glycemic index diet. And basically, over the next six months, um, they managed to keep off this 8% weight loss, whereas all the other diets are just creeping up. Okay, so, so that's the bad news. The other diets had this creeping up of weight. The good news is that they didn't recover all the weight. 8% weight loss in, in the average obese person is about 8 kilos, because the average 30 BMI 30 individual weighs 100 kilos, 16 stones in old money. Um, and so they've lost 8 kilos. They only regained between 1 and 2 kilos here in 6 months, so that's actually pretty good. Um, as, as, as an outcome, but of course, if you draw scales like that, you can give all sorts of messages. But this was the thing that was very interesting, and this is now the basis of this new project um, that, that we're involved in uh, with Gareth and colleagues around the world. Um, the clinical bit was supposed to start in July, it'll probably be August or September. Um, there's gonna be an initial weight loss on a low energy diet, and then a high protein and uh, either low GI, um, or a normal GI weight maintenance diet plus um, different exercise intensities to see whether a higher intensity exercise is better at helping maintain this weight loss uh, against a moderate. But the outcome of this is not weight loss. The outcome of this is incidence of new diabetes. These people are going to be at risk of diabetes. They'll have impaired glucose tolerance um, and we're going to follow them for three years and the end point is who gets diabetes. And if you choose the right people to start with, then the likelihood is that between 8 and 10% of them will get diabetes in a year. Okay, so over three years, we're talking about 20% or so of this population of 2,000 people, if we didn't do anything to them, would get type 2 diabetes. And so the, the, uh, the intention is to see if, if you can reduce that, and particularly uh, whether or not the, the glycemic index of the carbohydrate within the diet and or the type of exercise that they do um, reduces this prevalence of new diabetes. So we'll, we'll just have to see, um, as I say, it's not starting for about five or six months yet, and then it will go on for another three years after that. So it will be about four years plus from now before we actually get some answers. The final thing I want to just show you is, is something that uh, one of my um, recent PhD students, who's now a postdoc in New York, but She's very, very good and very energetic. She comes from North Wales originally. Um, but she's a bugger at writing papers. And I just, I mean, you know, this is fantastic. Well, I think this is fantastic. Uh, I presented this first two years ago in a talk. We still haven't quite submitted the paper. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, what, we're, what we were interested in was, was, was looking at the satiating effects of things that you might consume an hour and a half to two hours uh, before a main meal, so a snack. Um, and whether or not protein or soluble fiber uh, within this snack extends satiety beyond the period of, of eating this small snack which might only have a couple of hundred calories in it and have an effect on what you would eat at lunchtime, uh, for example, or later in the day. And we, we played around for a while with drinks and found that whey protein and, and uh, soluble fiber in the whey protein uh, did have some effects and we eventually ended up with a snack bar, but I'll show you the the, the drinks effect to start with. Uh, and so what we had to start with was a, a, a mid-morning uh, drink which had a, a reasonable protein content and a couple of hundred calories in the drink. And then we added a soluble fiber to it. And then this is the consumption at lunchtime ad libitum. Uh, and this is, this is a reasonably tasty um, pasta and tomato sauce and cheese mixture uh, meal that you put into a bowl but you keep adding it to the bowl, so people have got no idea how much they've eaten. So it's a bottomless bowl, if you like. Um, these are, oops, that was good. Um, sorry about that. Um, these are ad libitum energy intakes at lunch, okay? And those who can do their arithmetic will figure out that these subjects, when there's no polydextrose in this 200 calorie snack in the middle of the morning, are eating nearly 1,500 calories at lunchtime. These are healthy young men, and when you offer them free food, um, it disappears with an incredible speed. Uh, it's just, uh, well, it's incredible. Uh, we get the same effect in young women, but they're much more sensible, and they only eat about 800 calories when you offer them a, a, a bottomless bowl. So that's still way above what they'd normally eat at lunchtime. 
Um, but look at this. This is a reduction uh, down to about 4,500 from nearly 6,000 kilojoules in, in ad libitum lunch intake. So 25 grams of polydextrose, which is quite a lot. But they, they actually couldn't really tell the difference between these preloads. Um, so there is an acute su suppression of ad libitum energy intake when two hours earlier you have 200 calories in each condition, but um, it's got different amounts of polydextrose in it. So that was interesting, but it was just a single exposure. So the question was, does it disappear with time? So what we did, we got the Mars company to make some um, snack bars uh, with either a protein polydextrose mixture and other things, carbohydrate in there, or um, a control bar, which essentially was a fudge. It was a mixture of carbohydrate and fat. Okay, and we kept them in the freezer because they would have tended to melt it if you'd left them out. And people had one a day for 14 days. And, and the, um, the protein had, had predominantly was a whey protein, so a soluble protein base. The energy content was the same in, in these two, but there was no polydextrose or protein in this one. And this was done like a drug trial. It was A and B, it was randomized and double blind, and they only broke the code at the very end when we uh, um, uh, had presented all the data. The, the protocol is, is, is just like a pharmaceutical trial. There's, a, there's an initial visit, then 14 days of consuming the snack bar and eating ad libitum, and a second visit, then a washout period uh, for, for 14 days, and then the other treatment. And each of these big blue arrows is illustrated here, uh, where we have um, an initial blood sample and some uh, visual analog scale appetite ratings. Uh, the um, uh, a standard breakfast, two and a half hours after the standard breakfast, the snack bar, and, and then uh, something like two and a half hours after that, the ad libitum test meal, and then you monitor for an hour and then you let them go and get them to keep a diet, uh, diary and, and so on. And all the red arrows here are blood samples. As, as Gareth knows, we, we like sticking cannulas into people's veins and taking blood out as often as we can to measure things. Um, these are then the key results. This is lunch intake. That's the control snack bar. That's the first exposure, and that's two weeks later. And this is the protein polydextrose snack bar, the first exposure two weeks later. So look, it works with the snack bar as well as it does with a, um, uh, the drink and it carries on working for 14 days. So this is ad libitum intake at lunchtime. There's no difference between those two. There's no difference between those two, but both of those are bigger than both of these. Um, and the intake for the rest of the day is also a bit lower. You can see it's creeping up over the 14 day period, but it is lower in the blue, which is the rest of the day after the protein and polydextrose snack bar mid morning than the control one, where the energy content of these two bars is the same. So the good news is it isn't just suppressing intake there, it's having an effect over the whole day. Now the, um, the real problem is with this, and, and um, this, is a, this has been very salutary. When I looked at the results, and when I first presented the results, two weeks is quite a long time for that degree of energy intake difference. And so I said to Neris, I said, where are the body weights? And she said, I didn't measure the body weights. She said, you said that two weeks wasn't long enough to change body weight, so we won't measure it. I said, I never said that. She said, yes, you did. So anyway, we agreed to disagree, but, but the sad thing is we do not know what happened to body weight. So, so um, that's a real problem, but anyway. We got all the blood samples and, and uh, all the uh, satiety hormones and insulin sensitivity and all the rest, and everything fits with, with there being uh, beneficial effects of, of, of this. Um, slight suppression of energy intake, and they almost certainly lost maybe half a kilo or something like that if you do the calculations. But unfortunately, we haven't got the body weight, so just be warned. Um, even the best experiments that you think you've planned beautifully, sometimes you've forgotten the most important thing. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, the final thing is dairy foods. There have been a lot of suggestions, certainly recently, that dairy foods, possibly because of special peptide fragments that are in them, or maybe the calcium that's in there, uh, maybe a benefit in weight management. Um, if you look at the systematic reviews of the literature that have looked at randomized controlled trials of at least four weeks duration, um, then that actually um, gives you a good way of just evaluating that. Um, and so these, these trials that were looked at in the systematic review 
Um, they were, a lot of them were studies in weight loss and weight maintenance, but others were just in normal weight people eating whatever they felt like. Overall, from this sort of approach, there was no clear effect of dairy produce on body weight, but a potential effect on body fat content or, or, or fat-free mass. Um, and uh, people then went on to do a sort of secondary analysis, which is never really acceptable as far as systematic reviews are concerned. You're supposed to say in advance what it is you're looking at and then just look at that. So these secondary analyses are always a bit, um, uh, people look at them a bit suspiciously. But if you look at this, this is the way systematic reviews are represented. Um, uh, and, and basically, there is a zero change line here. And if you're moving in one direction, uh, then uh, that, that indicates that whatever the comparisons you have uh, are, are beneficial or harmful for that particular thing. Um, this is actually increasing dairy intake to the, to the left here. And, and what you can see is that in situations where there is energy restriction, so that's a low energy diet, these are individual studies with the range or the confidence intervals of the observations for the individual studies there. Almost all of them are to the left of the line, which is benefit with dairy produce. And, and a few of them cross the line. But then when you do a, 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 um, a meta-analysis, statistical analysis, combining all of these, you see that there's a clear effect. When you do it without energy restriction, the meta-analysis is there, uh, and, it, and it just is to the right of the line, So there's, and most of the dots are to the right of the line, sorry, there. So there's less convicting, uh, convincing effect. If anything, it's not quite harmful, uh, because that is straddling the line. When you combine the two, you combine everything, it's not quite significant because it just goes over the line. So, depends how you want to analyze it. There, there may be benefit in having dairy produce in a weight reduction diet um, from that, but they should have done that analysis on its own and said that's what they were going to do to start with, and they didn't, so people don't believe it. Um, if you look at change in fat mass, it gets a bit more interesting because actually the change in fat mass in those energy restriction studies is, is, is more convincing, all to the left, and so powerful, and there's one en without energy restriction study here where there's a, a loss in fat mass as well with an increase in dairy intake. And so that impacts on the overall analysis shows that an increase in dairy intake overall is associated with a reduction in fat mass. Um, and then there was another study which, which showed a, a similar thing, uh, except this is presented the other way up just to confuse everybody. So this is without energy restriction, again, no benefit of dairy, but with energy restriction, uh, there is a, um, a benefit of dairy. And these, these are some slightly different studies. This is a more recent analysis, so there are more studies in this. But again, overall, no effect. So um, there's certainly a possibility that an increase in dairy intake, it may be the whey protein, it may be something else. And again, the fat mass change was, was, was beneficial there too. So, so those two analyses um, certainly provide an indication that, that dairy, um, possibly the protein, maybe the calcium, uh, could be of value as far as weight management is concerned. So diet composition, the amount you eat, the patterns that you have it, clearly have an impact on energy balance and obesity development and maintenance. Higher protein, probably with lower glycemic index foods, um, seem to be beneficial. Uh, we're going to be involved clearly in this trial combined with exercise to see if that benefit uh, conveys itself as far as reducing the, the um, development of diabetes is concerned. Whey protein is certainly very interesting, and, and there's a potential satiating factor. Uh, it deserves a great deal more investigation, this time measuring people's body weight. Um, and dairy foods, other than whey protein, may have a, a role to play. The dairy industry is certainly very interested in that as a possibility. Um, but it may well be that actually their main role is, is in the situation of energy restriction. And it could well be from our, our snack bar studies that they, they facilitate energy restriction, that the whey protein helps you um, be more satisfied and, and uh, has a reduction in, uh, in, in hunger and, and tends to help have a reduced energy intake. The problem with this, and this is the exercise slide, uh, the, the problem with this is that there's no easy solution. Whatever diet you produce, unless it's got amphetamines in it, people are still going to have to um, be determined to change what they're doing. This is actually, it was originally a Danish uh, cartoon um, uh, and, and this is a famous Danish doctor in the Danish cartoon. 
and he's telling his rather plump patient that he needs to exercise, and the patient's quite happy to exercise as long as he can have it in tablet form, because he's damn sure he's not going to go out and do any exercise himself. It's the same with diet, and so one of the things that we all have to try and do is to reprogram what's going on inside there, so that people are more um, inclined to be active and to eat more appropriately and drink more appropriately. Thanks very much.